Welcome to the Q1 2023 update from Ryerson Issues Investment Trust. I'm Dan Nichols, and I manage the trust alongside my colleague, Matt Cable. If you've had a chance to watch our introductory video, you'll know that Matt and I took over Ryerson Issues in October last year, following on from 39 very successful years under the management of Simon Knott. We go into a lot more detail in that video, but very briefly, our approach is to retain the best of the heritage of the trust, combined with the benefits of a large, well-resourced investment team. Indeed, Matt and I are part of Jupiter's mid- and small-cap equities team, which is made up of eight investment professionals, as well as a dedicated ESG specialist. We believe we're one of the largest and best-resourced small-cap teams in the UK market. Today, we'd like to update you on progress and developments since we took over the trust, talk a bit about a couple of stocks we hold, and share some thoughts on the outlook for UK small caps over the coming months. Matt, perhaps you could start by talking a bit about the overall structure of the portfolio. Thanks, Sam. Yes, of course. Rise and Issues has historically been run in a very concentrated style. The closed ended structure has the advantage of not having daily flows, which means the fund can cope with more volatility and lower liquidity, allowing a greater focus and concentration on a smaller number of a manager's highest conviction ideas. None of this will change, and we expect to maintain a portfolio of something like 20 to 25 stocks. On the day we took the fund on, the portfolio consisted of 23, and today it is 22. What we are planning to change over time is the concentration within the stocks we hold, for example, at the point of take on, the top 10 holdings accounted for about 84% of the fund's assets. As at the end of January, that was down to around 71%, and we expect it to come down somewhat further. At the other end of the portfolio, we are keen to make sure that all positions are of a size that can be meaningful to performance. We believe very strongly in responsible ownership, so are likely to spend as much time engaging with a company that is a tiny holding as a large one without any realistic prospect of it contributing to performance. On this front, we have reduced the number of holdings worth less than 1% of the portfolio from 9 to 4, and again expect to make further progress. Thanks, Matt. Aside from the overall shape of the portfolio, we're also in the process of focusing our holdings on the part of the market where we believe we have an edge, that is, mid- and small-cap companies that we research as a team. As such, We've begun the process of reducing holdings in stocks that are too large in market cap terms for this kind of mandate. At the smaller end, and in line with the comments Matt just made, we're also unlikely to hold very small companies in the long term, as it's difficult to hold them in sufficient size to make the positions meaningful to performance. Again, we've started to make some progress in this respect, and now I've only two holdings with a market cap below 50 billion down from four when we took over the portfolio. The final aspect of the portfolio we're developing is its balance in terms of sector and style exposures. The trust has traditionally been run with a distinct skew towards certain sectors, for example, industrial and engineering businesses. And we plan to broaden this exposure by adding investments in sectors which have tended to be underrepresented, such as financial services. As well as helping to diversify the portfolio, this will help ensure that our shareholders benefit from, benefit from the sector-specific expertise we have in the team by capturing the best ideas we have in each area. Dan, it's perhaps worth emphasising at this point that our approach to transitioning the portfolio has been and will continue to be very careful and considered. We've been very clear with the Trust's board that we are fully responsible for performance from day one, so every change we make has to be in shareholders' best interests. There's no concept of a transition period here, and we're not working to any arbitrary deadlines. Thanks, Matt. As we reduce the size of some of our largest positions and exit holdings that are less suitable for the portfolio, we're able to start adding some new stocks to the fund. So far, we've introduced five new companies with a bias towards technology and telecoms, as well as financial services. All of these stocks are ones we hold in other portfolios run by the team and have been identified through our tried and tested investment process. Matt, perhaps you can talk a little about Alpha Group and how it fits that process. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. So Alpha is a business we know very well, 
and have held as a team since its IPO in 2017. It is a founder-led provider of FX, payments and banking services to small businesses and institutional investment funds. What makes Alpha unusual is its focus on developing long-term relationships with its clients so that it builds highly visible, sticky revenue streams, in contrast to the transactional models that are more typical of its markets. This is probably best illustrated by its core FX service, in which it helps develop long-term hedging programs for clients, which it then executes for them, rather than simply trying to win individual transactions as a traditional FX broker would. All this all means is that Alpha has a strong structural growth driver. It starts EG with an established book of business, and then layers new clients into this. Given that a significant proportion of its costs are relatively fixed, in other words, those that come from running its systems and operations, much of this growth can convert into profit, and hence drive the high margins that Alpha typically produces. This kind of high and relatively predictable growth fits into our investment process well, and combined with management's consistently conservative forecasting, means that the market gets a steady flow of positive surprises, another key criteria we look for in an investment. As I said earlier, we're taking a very considered approach to evolving the portfolio. McFarlane is a provider of packaging solutions to online retailers and industrial clients. It only manufactures a small proportion of its most complex packaging, but rather specialises in solving the packaging challenges that its clients face. These range from the practical, such as protecting products in transit, to the aesthetic and financial. Perhaps unsurprisingly, these considerations have been joined today by environmental and even social issues, for example, switching from plastics to paper and ensuring that supply chains are fully audited. McFarland today is the largest indirect supplier of packaging in the UK, which gives it significant buying power, distribution coverage. We think that this will allow it to grow domestically, complemented by a plan to selectively expand in Europe, where its key customers are looking to bring in a proven partner. This growth, alongside a very attractive valuation, means that the company is a good fit for our investment process, and therefore a likely long-term holding for rights and issues. Of course, an important aspect of our investment process is integrating a top-down view of markets with bottom-up stock research. So would it be worth touching on our current thoughts and outlook to finish off? Yeah, sure. As you say, our team process combines detailed bottom-up stock analysis with top-down thinking. The top-down element informs the thematic and sector positioning of our funds. So even though we're UK mid and small cap specialists, the top-down view is really important. So how would we characterise the macro backdrop and how does this influence portfolio positioning now? Activity across the developed world seems to be holding up better than expected. We expect that any slowdown will actually be relatively shallow and short-lived. Unincumbent rates are low and currently show little sign of rising materially. Goods prices are beginning to rise more slowly and in certain categories are falling in absolute terms. But wage and services inflation does look stickier. Central bankers are signalling that they intend to take a more data-dependent approach to setting interest rates from here. And the markets interpreting this, correctly in our view, as a sign that we're close to a peak of rates. However, we expect central bankers to be in no hurry to cut rates once they've reached that peak. They'd surely prefer to endure a period of lacklustre economic growth and risk releasing the inflation genie from the bottle having recently raised rates so aggressively to combat it. Given this backdrop, within the UK mid and small gap opportunity set, we struggle to see market leadership emanating from either the growth or value theme on a sustained basis and therefore seek to shape the portfolio over time such, such that it's balanced between both. In our view, therefore, the portfolio should seek to combine exposure to less economically sensitive businesses that we think can deliver well above average rates of earnings growth at valuations we can rationalise, with more economically sensitive businesses that we believe can re-rate as fears over a deep and protracted recession recede. Thanks, Dan. That will make sense. So, in summary, our plan is to combine the best of rights and issues heritage and philosophy with the significantly greater resources of Jupiter's small and mid-cap team. That's right. 
taking a careful and considered approach to transitioning to a more balanced portfolio, but retaining the concentrated and high conviction approach that has been the hallmark of rice and issues over the years. We look forward to keeping shareholders up to date on developments over the coming months.